So Russian knife must be uh, maybe a successful. Yeah, it's very well done. Thank you. Um, I'm working on two new projects, actually. Um, one of them is a history of the Moscow Polytechnical Museum, which opened in 1872 and has been in continuous existence to today. Um, the other project, is, and the project that I'm going to talk about this morning, uh, is on the fate of Russian voluntary associations after the revolution of 1917. And I'll just tell you a couple of words about how I got interested in this project. Um, a couple of years ago, a group of historians got together, American and British historians primarily, uh, to plan a multi-volume history of Russia during war, revolution, and civil war from 1914 to 1921. Uh, Russia and its continuum of, of chaos, I guess, to, to borrow Peter Hulquist's uh, terminology. And I have agreed to do an entry for this multi-volume series on Russian voluntary associations. And I'm going to co-author it with a colleague in Moscow named Anastasia Tumanova. And both of us have published books on Russia's pre-revolutionary uh, associations. So in a way, we're, trying, we're kind of continuing our work uh, in the, for World War I and Revolution period. We've divided up our responsibility, Anastasia and I divided up our responsibility a little bit. She's um, taken the years 1914 to 1917. And I've taken the years, as you can see on the screen, I've taken the years 1917 to 1921. Even in the uh, years after the revolution, there were still hundreds of voluntary associations, or perhaps to use a more uh, contemporary terminology, NGOs. Uh, there were there were probably before the revolution there were probably more than ten thousand NGOs in Russia, which is really quite remarkable since Russia is not a country that we, we we think of as a place that really cultivates individual initiative. Uh, but even after 1917, there still were hundreds of uh, NGOs, but they have been treated only tangentially in the literature. Um, there, have, there are many social histories of the period, but they tend to focus on government policy or on the party and party policy. 
much less on the reactions of ordinary Russians, even Russian intellectuals, uh, to policy, and especially the reaction of what we might call a kind of middle class or middle classes. There are certainly been studies of scientists uh, under the Soviet regime, but organizationally, most of these studies tend to focus on the upper registers of the scientific community in Soviet Russia, uh, primarily on the Academy of Sciences. Um, and uh, the conclusion of many of these studies of Russian scientists is that um, after the first few years, after 1917, a partnership developed between the scientific community and the new uh, Soviet regime. Uh, in fact, the work here of Kendall Bales uh, has been very influential. Uh, his book on the uh, scientific and technical intelligentsia, and he argues that the scientific intelligentsia got preferential treatment after 1917 and thereby gained power and influence um, under the new regime. Um, I'm not out to refute that, but I'm changing, the, altering the focus slightly and concentrating on uh, independent and professional scientific associations, what are sometimes have been labeled by their enemies bourgeois, uh, bourgeois associations, and and what how they reacted, how they coped to uh, the conditions of war and revolution and civil war, especially after 1917. And I'm taking a very small sample of associations, and they're up, they're on the screen. And I put also their Russian initials, at least where initials are used widely, as well as the their birth and death dates, at least as, as far as we know. Um, these organizations were very prominent before 1917, and I wrote something about them in, in, in my book. I don't claim that they are typical of all of Russian science societies, much less all of Russian uh, NGOs. But by seeing their fate after 1917, we can kind of track the fate of NGOs in general, um, and also see and get an insight into the relationship between the new regime and independent um, organizations. And as I hope I can uh, show you today, however briefly, we can see paths of resistance, opposition to the new regime, as well as paths of accommodation and cooperation and uh, success. Last thing by way of introduction, I should say, is that the sources pose severe problems for the years 1917 to 1921. The publications of these organizations, which were prolific before 1917, the library, whole library shelves, uh, had proceedings, meetings, congresses, uh, scientific papers, and so on. After October 1917, this plummets. This already, by itself, perhaps says something about the fate of these organizations, although I'm not going to sort of focus on that particular aspect. The memoir literature is also scant. So many Russians left, you know, intellectual Russians left after 1917. Uh, the independent periodical press is pretty much gone by the end of 1918. Uh, the archival record, which I have used for this uh, paper, is very fragmentary. I have been able to get some stuff from archives in Moscow and Petersburg, but it's, it's quite hit and miss. And unfortunately, a potentially very rich archival source, that is the papers of the Cheka, uh, which it would have had surveillance uh, function over uh, uh, public activities, they are in the archive of the FSB in Moscow, and uh, as far as I've been able to gather, virtually inaccessible to foreigners and, and uh, rather difficult even for, for Russians. So by necessity, uh, my talk today, as well as the article for the volume, will be rather episodic. It's not going to be a nice seamless narrative. I'm going to focus on certain moments when there is some information. Uh, to base them. Well, before, a, a, a good way to get a sense of the reaction of these organizations to the Bolshevik Revolution is to see what they felt of 
about the, uh, the February Revolution that overthrew the monarchy. All of these organizations welcomed the February Revolution for a variety of reasons. Perhaps first and foremost is that it meant an end to a very intrusive czarist bureaucracy. Uh, now, now we have an opportunity to freely associate. We can have as many meetings as we want. We can do whatever we want. Uh, so that the, uh, there's a great sort of rejoicing almost uh, when uh, the, the monarchy was overthrown. Uh, and this was especially true of the Free Economic Society, the first one up there on the list, and also the Pirogov Society of Russian Physicians. And just for my example here, I'll take that of the Pirogov Society, which was founded in the 1880s, and it become a focal point and mouthpiece uh, for community physicians in Russia. Their ideal was the Zemsky Vrach, the selfless uh, doctor uh, laboring on behalf of the people. Uh, and this Pirogov Society organized a series of congresses of Russian physicians which became very prominent in Russian intellectual life because many of them uh, uh, were noteworthy for their anti-government speeches beginning in the 1890s. Uh, there was plenty of criticism of the Tsarist government uh, at these Pirogov Congresses, which actually were sanctioned by that very Tsarist government. So, not surprisingly, the Pirogov Society welcomed with open arms the overthrow of the monarchy in, in February. Uh, and it sent, it, it sent a congratulatory telegram uh, to the provisional government, and all, another telegram very profusely uh, praising the Petrograd Soviet, because that embodied the sort of true democracy. At least it seemed then. Uh, in, in April of 1918, uh, 1917, just a month after the overthrow of the, of the monarchy, there was another Pirogov Congress, and it passed all sorts of political revolutions. Uh, on behalf of national self-determination, uh, for the democratization of local government, uh, land to the people, uh, an eight-hour day, uh, support of the war effort. By the way, all of these organizations in the spring of 1917 were very, very, very energetic and very uh, committed to pursuing the war effort. <coughs> uh, and the Pirogov Society looked forward that spring to um, greater influence in public health policy under the provisional <coughs> government than it had had before under the Tsarist regime. Well, let's fast forward, because I want to get more into the sort of post-1970, or post-October. Let's fast forward to the reaction of these organizations to October 1917, slightly differently. All of these, all of, on my list here, opposed or spoke out against in, in, in the meetings of these organizations and various conferences that they had, spoke out against the Bolshevik coup. Uh, the Bolsheviks were usurpers; they were zakhvatchiki uh, of political power, and that was almost formulaic. Uh, the president of the Free Economic Society, who was the venerable populist uh, Tchaikovsky, he spoke of criminal elements and demagogues, which were stirring up the ignorant masses. And again, this is almost formulaic. Again and again and again in the literature, you, 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 read, you read that reaction to what was going on in the fall uh, and early winter of 1917. Among many issues that galvanized, especially galvanized the Free Economic Society, the Moscow Agricultural Society, and the Pirogov Society, among many issues that galvanized them in the fall of 1917 was the fate of the Constituent Assembly. Um, and here, again, especially prominent was the Free Economic Society in Petrograd. It organized meetings. Uh, it publicized the F Constituent Assembly and why this body was so important, uh, elect the elections for which, uh, were, by the way, were just after the Bolshevik seizure of power. Uh, it, the Free Economic Society appealed to soldiers and sailors to support the Constituent Assembly and uh, came up with a slogan, very, nice, very nicely done, a slogan, all power to the Constituent Assembly, which of course nicely mimicked a Bolshevik slogan, all power to the Soviets, 
in the spring of 1917. The fall of 1917, Bolsheviks weren't using that slogan quite so much. On the night of January 10th, uh, there was a search. Red Guards came onto the premises of the Free Economic Society, searched the premises, and arrested several members of a very short-lived union uh, to defend the Constituent Assembly. Likewise, the Pirogov Society called upon physicians to resist um, the Bolsheviks. Uh, I have some sort of really juicy quotes. I don't, probably won't have time to, 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 to really give you them all, but um, at a uh, Pirogov meeting in the end of November 1917, uh, there were several uh, speeches um, to the effect that the Bolsheviks had taken measures from the darkest years of autocracy, uh, that uh, they were going to uh, kill the idea of local self-government and community, community control, and so on, and on and on and on. Very, very hostile re uh, reaction. Nevertheless, the uh, physicians of the Pirogov Society faced a very, very, very difficult question, as did all of these uh, professional and scientific so they faced the Stodilet question. Uh, in the words of uh, a speaker at a meeting of the Free Economic Society, uh, he said, he put, he put it bluntly, he said, we have no bandits. And the Pirogov Society decided in the end that physicians should stay on the job. Whether it's Hippocratic Oath or whether it was simply a, Russia in a dire need, uh, physicians needed to continue to work, whatever the regime. Well, the Bolsheviks, for their part, um, <clears throat> denounced the Pirogov Society as counter-revolutionary. And the last thing you wanted to be in 1918 was counter-revolutionary. And many organizations uh, collapsed or died or were shut down within a year after the Bolshevik seizure of power. The teachers' union, most religious and charitable societies, for obvious reasons. Uh, the Boy Scouts were shut down because the, uh, the Komsomol declared that Scoutism was a bourgeois. And many organizations simply, simply died. Uh, there was harassment, there were searches and arrests. I already mentioned the search at the Free Economic Society, but there were searches of the premises of other organizations as well as at the universities, Moscow University and Petrograd University. Non-Bolshevik newspapers were closed by the middle of 1918. I think I already mentioned that. Perhaps even more important for the scientific and professional associations was the collapse of publishing in the book market. Because they lived. They lived on spreading the word uh, and publicizing their activities, their scientific advancements, um, spreading education, and so on. There's also a series of early Bolshevik financial measures that were designed to break the back of the bourgeoisie. They were not directed specifically at organizations, but they were designed to break the back of the bourgeoisie that had the effect of reducing the independence and sources of support for NGOs. Uh, most of these organizations, before the revolution, had small endowments, very small endowments, uh, that were in, uh, invested in government bonds. And the interest on these bonds was what they used for operating expenses. Along with membership dues, donations, some uh, government subsidies, fees for lectures, publication, sale of publications, and so on. Well, from December 1917 uh, through the summer of 1918, there were a series of measures. The banks were nationalized. Uh, perhaps most troubling, interest and dividend payments were canceled. This had the effect of forcing organizations to cut back their activities uh, and their projects. The diary of a historian, Yuri Gautier, uh, that was published uh, uh, in a wonderful translation with commentary by Terence Emmons at Stanford. Gautier was the director of the Rumyantsev Museum Library. And his diary captures this sort of state of siege in these first couple of years after 1917. The material deprivation, which of course is all over in the literature, food and fuel shortages, uh, people in Moscow chopping down wooden buildings simply to, uh, for fuel, 
And one of di and one of Gautier's diary entries, uh, he says that no that nothing is more terrible than a deserted bank with soldiers holding sway. And in another diary entry, this I think is 1919 or 1920, he said it is now below zero in the Rumantsev Museum. The ink is freezing, hence my title. The ink is freezing, death, cold, and hungry is everywhere. Well, it's easy enough to draw a picture of gloom and doom. But the uh, actions of the Bolsheviks were largely ad hoc. They did not have an immediate blueprint to wipe away all of these organizations. Their policies were inconsistent. There was a kind of good cop, bad cop. Uh, on the part of the new regime. There were Bolsheviks and there were Bolsheviks. Um, the laws and procedures which eventually kind of codified the legal status of NGOs, and that, you know, that would be problematic. What is an NGO in a socialist country? Uh, especially where the government is everything. Well, the le uh, pr uh, laws and procedures were not codified until 1922. So this is a, between 17 and 22 is very much a kind of no man's land or limbo of what is these organizations, what their status is. And on the good cop side of the ledger, uh, Narkompros, which was the Commissariat of uh, Education or the Public Enlightenment, however you want to translate that, Narkompros uh, subsidized organizations, it, uh, including all of these. Uh, it assisted scientists, it offered opportunities uh, to continue their work and so on, it offered opportunities for scientific research. And what I'd like to do kind of in the um, latter half of, of, of my presentation is to give you some case studies of accommodation and cooperation with the new regime, different stories of how individual organizations <laughs> coped with uh, their the sort of mixed and chaotic environment that surrounded them, a kind of mixed, friendly, semi-friendly, semi-hostile uh, atmosphere. Um, and most of all of my organizations, in fact, in, at one, in one way or another, tried to cooperate with the new regime for the sake of advancing science, advancing education, for helping Russia in a, in a dire moment, and perhaps at, at its most basic level, just simply to survive uh, as an organization. And uh, of course, Tolstoy, in his famous novel about scientific society, he opens up his novel with a, with a very well-known passage uh, that all happy organizations are happy in the same way, and all unhappy organizations are un each are unhappy in uh, they're separate ways. Just kidding. I'm getting about a novel. So mix But anyway, uh, the happy organizations were, in a way, happy all in one way. That is, they accommodated the best with the new regime. The unhappy ones uh, maybe didn't know that they were unhappy immediately, but, well, you'll see. You'll see what I mean. The organization that had, I think, the greatest difficulty in accommodating with the new regime was the Free Economic Society. It was Russia's oldest organization, perhaps most, uh, most famous, well, maybe second most famous. I think the geographical one was probably the most famous. Here's, <laughs> you have your pamphlet over there. Uh, the Free Economic Society was highly public, uh, politicized before 1917. Its leadership consisted of, of liberals, moderate socialists, educators, political economists, all of whom had very strong political opinions. It had been a thorn in the Tsarist paw uh, before 1917, and after October, as I've already hinted very briefly, it aided opposition groups, it strenuously supported the Constituent Assembly, and I have not been able to find any trace of its activity uh, after 1918. Uh, there was stuff in the archive about activities in 1918, including even members of the Free Economic Society were invited to participate in this or that commission under the new government, but I couldn't find anything about their demise uh, after that. And I would love, anyone, anyone knows, <laughs> 
I, I would love to find out, were they closed by some decree? Did they just simply die? I was going to say die a natural death, probably not so natural, but did they die? <laughs> did they just die? Uh, I've been trying to find that out. Uh, how about the Pure Glove Society? This equally was politicized, uh, had a very, very uh, political agenda before 1918. Um, uh, and it was vehement in its denunciation of the Bolsheviks. But it was not liquidated immediately. It kept going. And when the physicians found out they were not losing their jobs, uh, when they found out that there were actually opportunities to work in the new, uh, in the new uh, regime uh, for the new Commissariat of Health, the Nakhams Drav, uh, they, they welcomed the, that opportunity. But eventually, the Pirogov Society was caught up in a very, very interesting phenomenon, a phenomenon that's, a little, that's larger even than the Pirogov Society. Uh, the Pirogov story, let's say, is caught up in another story that's even larger, and that is the Sovietization of unions. What's that about, all about? Well, uh, during the revolution, uh, either uh, in 1917 and even early 1918, all sorts of new professional unions sprang up because they interpreted the signal from the provisional government and even from the, uh, from, from the Bolshevik government as an encouragement to form unions. And there was an all-Russian physicians union, I think that's up here somewhere, which was organized to defend professional interests and be a forum for uh, public health issues. Now, eventually, even if not immediately, the Bolshevik model of unions was not the trade or craft or professional union, but the industrial union. That is, to organize all workers in one branch of industry, in one union. To put it in American parlance, the Bolshevik model was not the AFL, but the CIO. And so in 1919, a, an, an alternate, a new union, was created, the All-Russian Union of Medical and Sanitary Workers. It united all those who were employed in the medical industry. And it was increasingly critical of the Pirogov Society and of this other, all the physicians' union. And by the way, Pirogov members were very prominent in the leadership of this physicians' union. But this, the medical sanitary workers, what is it, Sir Medica Santrud or something like that, uh, they were uh, critical of the Pirogov Society for its caste like. And this, again, was almost formulaic. You read it again and again and again, and the, the Kustavoy, fill in the blank, the Kustavoy uh, character, Kustavoy organizatia. Um, and the Medical Sanitary Workers Union opposed the registration of the Pirogov Society in 1922, when organizations now began to register for a legal existence under the new regime. And labeled, or, or, or uh, Medical Sanitary Workers Union said that the Pirogov Society was not useful, it was harmful, that Russian physicians must affirm their solidarity with the proletariat. And so from 1922 on, the Pirogov Society was in a kind of legal limbo and eked out an increasingly difficult existence. And as far as I can gather, after 1924, it's gone. Uh, there were, just as for physicians, there were opportunities with the new regime. There were also opportunities, and maybe even more of them, for engineers. And here the Russian Technical Society is, is the organization that I'm looking at. This is a very prominent pre-revolutionary organization founded in 1866. Uh, had patrons in the highest places of the Tsarist government, the Imperial Family, Ministry of Finance, and so on. Um, and for, the, for engineers and technical specialists, as I think you probably all know, had a much higher priority uh, in the new regime than did, than did physicians. And the Russian Technical Society initially did not fare badly at all. It had 16 divisions before 1917, everything from civil engineering and railroad building to electricity and aeronautics. Uh, these continued to operate. 
Technical Society prepared uh, reports for government agency on all manner of economic and technical questions after 1917. This obviously was very useful for a new regime, one of whose priorities was developing Russian, Russian industry, destroying, destroying it and also developing it at the same time. And the Technical Society continued to run vocational and technical schools and classes. The story of the Technical Society is slightly different from the Pirogov Society, although maybe has some, some similarities. It eventually was a victim of the Bolshevik dislike of duplication of function. As if we have one society of engineers, why do we need, why do we need more? Well, what happened, of course, in 1917 is that there are several new organizations of engineers which sp sprang up. Again, in the enthusiasm and so on of uh, the revolution. Um, and more and more, in the 1920s, the Russian Technical Society was perceived as superfluous. Its functions were duplicated by other organizations of engineers. Moreover, according to the secret police, uh, in this case, it's the successor of the Cheka, the Ogapau. Um, the Ogapau, and I saw some uh, memoranda of the Ogapau in the Moscow archive this summer. Uh, it claimed that the leadership of the Russian Technical Society uh, was uh, technical side was led by unreliables or reactionaries. I love the word unreliable. The uh, It's exactly the same word as the Tsar's secret police used for liberals. <laughs> Very. And the Ogapau did not want the Ministry or the Commissariat of Internal Affairs, better known to us as the NKVD, uh, did not want the NKVD to approve the charter of the Technical Society. So from the mid 1920s on, the Technical Society also existed in limbo. And it, along with all uh, associations of engineers, uh, died in 1929. In, during the first five-year point. Moscow Agricultural Society. Uh, its story is uh, a happier, at least for a while. Like, like all of these organizations, it experienced both um, economic and political hardship after October 1917. For example, in 1918, its repair shop, its agricultural school, and its experimental farm were nationalized. Uh, but nevertheless, the Moscow Agricultural Society cooperated with the new Commissariat of Agriculture, the Narkomziem, for the joint project of improving Russian agriculture and disseminating agricultural education, disseminating agricultural techniques and technology. Uh, and the, Mos the Moscow Agricultural Society even uh, found for itself, after October 1917, found for itself a new mission, and in a way, a very public mission. Uh, that is, it began to work on behalf of Russia's many small local agricultural societies. See, the Moscow one was a big one, and it, had a, it was national in its reach. But there's an estimate of, in 1915 that Russia had almost 6,000 small local agricultural societies. That's really quite remarkable. And after October 1917, there was great confusion about the status of these small local agricultural societies. What are they? Are they, uh, are they like new agricultural enterprises? And there all sorts of experimental enterprises were springing up. Uh, were they truly not-for-profit? And in Tsarist law, that was one of the definitions of an NGO, as a not-for-profit not for organization. What if an agricultural society has a seed, seed depot? What if it leases uh, machinery? Is it really a not-for-profit organization? Is it maybe like a cooperative that does have income and that it shares with all, all members? So there's confusion about these local agricultural societies, and especially at the local level. And when, in 1919, the local Soviet closed the Rostov 
agricultural society, arrested its leaders, and confiscated its property, the Moscow Agricultural Society stepped up to the plate in defense of the Rostov and other small local organizations and made the argument, that is the Moscow Agricultural Society, made the argument to uh, the Narkomziem and to other government agencies that Russia needed a network of strong local organizations for the sake of uh, improvement of Russian agriculture. In a way, very much like the physicians had made the argument that uh, medical, uh, medical organizations are necessary for the sake of Russian public health, which was bad enough before 1917 and, of course, became even worse afterwards. So, for a while, the Moscow Agricultural Society was able not only to continue its pre-revolutionary mission of, ed of education, but also to take on a new mission of advocacy, and advocacy within the kind of Soviet, Soviet context. And so it really did okay as long as agriculture was not Sovietized. Well, you all know what happened in 1929. And surprise, surprise, in 1929, the Moscow Agricultural Society is liquidated. Well, I suppose my two happy stories are uh, the last two, the Moscow Polytechnical Museum and the Russian Geographical Society. Now, the museum, of course, is not really a voluntary association, although it was founded by one. It was founded by a society of naturalists in Moscow in 1872. It uh, was uh, run by a museum governing board and in many ways operated very similar to a scientific organization. From 1872 on, the museum was a center of applied science, of research, of education, collection, and display. Uh, its auditorium it was a veritable civic center in Moscow, and there were all lectures all, on all sorts of topics, not just on physics and chemistry. Oh, I've seen in a, in a collection in Moscow, I saw a wonderful picture of the, this auditorium of the, of the Polytechnical Museum. Tolstoy was sitting in the front row at a lecture on x-rays. Uh, and after 1905, uh, well, actually just before and after 1917, futurists uh, gave poetry readings in the Moscow uh, of the auditorium of the Polytechnical Museum, and uh, to this day, or at least up until some ill health, uh, Yevtushenko every summer goes back and gives poetry readings in this auditorium. Now, the, the museum's leaders were actually rather enthusiastic and, opt and optimistic, optimistic about the new Soviet government, uh, because it seemed to them, seemed to the leaders of the museum that now, finally, there's a government in place which has the same agenda as we have had for generations. That is, popularizing science, throwing, uh, throwing funding behind science education, uh, bringing science to the people. And in fact, some slogans from Narcom Pros, uh, science to the masses, uh, open doors for all, serving the people. This was music to the ears of the Polytechnical Museum, because now it felt that its priorities find, merged with that of the new, the new government. And indeed, the museum has been in continuous operation to this day. It's still it's on prime real estate on Bianca Square in Moscow, although rumors have it that other people are interested in the building. <laughs> and, and yes, I, I've actually worked in their archive for a couple of summers, but I was told just as I was leaving, oh, well, next year you might not be able to come because we're going to have to move. Where? Oh, we don't know. Anyway, uh, the Russian Geographical Society maybe in, in, the, end, in the end was uh, a very happy story. It, before uh, 1917, had stuck to a strictly scholarly agenda. Uh, it had kept its nose out of politics. Um, it very much believed that its mission was to serve the state. Um, and in this, it's not maybe terribly surprising. In their, at their origins, most geographical societies are close to governments, especially to navies. Uh, and no, and the, the Russian Geographical Society is no exception. And that was very much, uh, and it, uh, it had um, um, 
leadership which, uh, in a sense, kind of made a deal with the new government that you support us. I mean, the Geographic is not the only organization that was trying to do this. You support us, and we will we will help you. Uh, we will give uh, we will uh, undertake exp expeditions. We will uh, write position papers about. Uh, the development of resources. This is something the Bolsheviks were very interested in. The new government was interested in uh, the development of resources. Um, one other thing that the Geographical Society was able to uh, capitalize on, especially its many branch organizations. The headquarters were in Petersburg, Petrograd, but there were many branch organizations scattered around the empire. Uh, and several in, the, in, in Siberia alone. And they were able to kind of hitch on to a new project, which was not founded by the Bolsheviks, but the Bolsheviks were interested in, of Krajavidenia, uh, the sort of information and study of, of the region. A geographical study, great. You know, this, this, is, this has our name on it. In the memoirs of a longtime influential member of the Geographical Society, and in fact the son of the pre-revolutionary secretary of the Geographical Society, his, and, and his, uh, the, the pre-revolutionary guy's name was uh, uh, Pyotr Petrovich Semyonov Chinshansky, and his son Vyenyamin uh, Petrovich Semyonov Chinshansky. Uh, his memoirs were just uh, published a couple of years ago in Moscow. Uh, by the same publishing company that I hope is eventually going to do a translation of my book. And Vinyamin Semyonov Tinshansky wrote that there was work for those who neither openly nor secretly opposed the regime. And this, in a way, this does kind of sum up uh, the attitude of many, many of, of the scientists. And so the Geographical Society, in, in, in many ways, I, I think perhaps most closely resembles kind of in its temperament, its approach, to it most closely resembled the Academy of Sciences uh, in, the, in, the, in the sense that it, it, it wanted to serve, serve science and serve um, the new regime. Well, uh, what can I conclude from all of this? The February Revolution, uh, I think, you can see, even though I t treated it very briefly, was regarded as a kind of a springtime, an opportunity uh, for organizations, an opportunity for uh, autonomy, for influence, for meetings, uh, uh, and there was enthusiasm about opportunities to work with the provisional government. Uh, but increasingly, the provisional government was seen as an unreliable partner or a, a, a partner which couldn't really uh, bring order to a country that was slipping into anarchy. After October, uh, these uh, organizations of scientists faced inconsistent Bolshevik <laughs> policies. They faced economic disruption. Uh, they faced financial measures, as I already mentioned, which uh, made their an independent existence difficult. Uh, hardship. Many NGOs died within a year or so after the revolution. But the Bolsheviks also needed scientists. And they even needed what were called bourgeois specialists. And actually, there's quite a bit of debate. This is a kind of underlying a lot of what I've been talking about, debate within uh, both government organizations and in the Bolshevik party between uh, using the bourgeois specialists and uh, uh, destroying the elite completely, the scientific elite completely. So the Bolshevik did need scientists, but nevertheless they were suspicious of independent associations and unions that might of, of scientists and educators that might become independent forums to discuss or evaluate policy or there could be independent forums to express interests. Their long-term policy, which you know, was, was not realized immediately, but the long-term policy of the new uh, government was to subordinate professional organizations to Soviet-controlled unions or Soviet-controlled other kinds of larger, larger bodies. 
Nevertheless, good cop, bad cop, there are opportunities for survival. There are opportunities for cooperation for the sake of science, for the sake of education, for the sake of patriotism. Uh, and the story of deprivation, which per pervades the literature, even, in, even the, in the publications of the Geographical Society, there's plenty about, you know, what hard times we live through. And I mean, Petrograd, from 1918 to 1921, it's hard to imagine times worse. You'd have to go to Leningrad in 41, 42, I suppose, to, 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 to conceive of worse uh, deprivation. The story of deprivation, as it is throughout Western literature, the story of deprivation is also a story of triumph over adversity. And indeed, the, uh, uh, Kendall Bales, who actually tends to be rather, rather optimistic, I suppose, rather positive uh, about this, uh, he concludes that, quote, a flexible, decentralized system of government research organizations evolved in the early Soviet years, which allowed the scientific and intelligentsia to prosper and to gain influence. For me, the key word in his quotation there, flexible, decentralized system, I think that's what Kendall Bales wants to emphasize. But the word that I see is government research organizations. This was a system that eventually, if not immediately, had no place for independent organizations which could articulate and represent interests. Um, but that's uh, all I have to say, so I'll let, uh, I'll let you I go ahead. Quick, quick questions. You, uh, in the end, mentioned the happiest, the geographical society. Would you agree that the, from its very foundation, imperial geographical society, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the idea was to <coughs> safeguard the interests of a great state, and the journal they had, the Crying the Sea, was looking into the Construct democracy, they have a tendency for like paternalistic model. So somebody brings us democracy. And that's why uh, I think it's very important to measure like active participation, willingness to participate. I think I indirectly tapped into this question. I didn't put it up on slide, but for example, I asked them a question about how important politics work. So I asked how important, actually, it's, it's not on, on this slide. There was a question where I asked how important uh, free time, participation in politics, having, you know, spending time with friends, like free of charge education, free of charge medical care. So I was actually, I did ask them about, about that. I just didn't put this up on slide. So I did ask them about how important for them to be actively involved in politics. I think some other questions also indirectly tap into this dimension, like, like democratic culture, which entails, uh, being conscientious about, conscientious about being able to influence critical processes, or, um, um, so, yeah, it's, it was not a part, it was not, you know, formulated exactly the way you would like it to see, but I did tap into their, the level of political activism and, and how important it was them. I didn't ask them how much they participated, but I asked them to gauge how important it was for them to be actively involved in politics, including through uh, active protests or uh, demonstrations. Well, I think you also tapped into that question. I, I found it interesting when most of the respondents said that they um, viewed the state as promoting democracy and not the people, and that it was very top-down as far as implementing democracy. I think that could be a, a part of the where they perceive democracy coming from a grassroots versus state implemented um, method of governance. Okay. You know, if Robert Putnam were here, he'd ask if they have bowling leagues. Well, <coughs> keep in mind that uh, it's, it, those, those are unpaid people. Those are people who are struggling with you know, for many of them, there was the very first time someone approached them to, they've never seen the survey. Uh, they had to be interpreted. All of the questions, uh, many of them had required, you know, some assistance. And any additional thing that would have been included in the survey. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah. But I think I think this is something that I did tap into. And for me, for th for the purpose of this research, it, it is more important 
to know how important politics <coughs> is for them compared to, for example, family or free time or being able to have a guaranteed job. You know, so in terms of the priorities, all other priorities, where does this political activism stand for that? I know you said you didn't um, <clears throat> well, have too many of the older um, generation, but did, did you notice a difference in the responses from from the few that you had versus the younger um, respondents that you had? Um, women in their 40s was the most difficult category of respondents to deal with. Uh, uh, younger generation and uh, males in general and older people were much more interested and willing to contribute than, than uh, females in, in their 40s. <laughs> and I'm not asking, I mean, that, that, that was like, yeah, it was very difficult to, to actually feel in that, that category of women in their 40s. Um, but I didn't, I didn't like uh, uh, run correlations between ages and responses yet, so I don't know if there will be significant and interesting differences, but I will. I will I'll definitely look in, uh, cross tabulate those and look into the differences. Uh, so in your personal opinion, uh, does this model of Central Asian democracy exist in the real world, or it is just, like, it doesn't exist? Is it real one or it is just uh, nothing is real? I mean, it's all those are just. I mean, these are my ways of presenting something, simplifying something uh, to you. I mean, none of those really exist. Exist. Those are just analytical frameworks, and uh, what it's suggestive of is that there are competing ideas mm -hmm. which have strong resonance in some cultures and some states in some societies. So we shouldn't be taken for granted that everyone else is going to embrace Western liberal ideology, uh, just like we all do. That there are strong, strong normative powers in that part of the world. Russia, China, Singapore, other Asian tigers. They are the normative power in that even though they're not imposing or promoting something as actively as the West does, indirectly they are suggesting an alternative vision of how states should develop and which is very appealing to those regimes and without taking those new normative powers into consideration the west will never be able to succeed in accomplishing the goals they want to accomplish either related to democracy promotion or other strategic initiatives there well, that's kind of a pessimistic note, but I, I think we're going to have to draw to close our formal presentation. And these discussions, of course, can continue informally, but I want to thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.